Hi, everyone. This is, um, this is really exciting. Uh, Appium Comp is super uh, inspiring and energizing for me. So um, yeah, Dan already introduced me. I look like that. I'm even wearing the same hat. And uh, I have a different shirt on today, so I'm a little bit off brand for Cloud Gray, but um, you know it works. So yeah, I, uh, I worked on Appium for a long time, uh, mostly while I was at Sauce Labs, and then um, more recently started my own consulting firm around uh, mobile, mobile automation strategy, and obviously do a lot with Appium, and happy to say that I've even worked with some of the people in this room in that capacity before. It's been a lot of fun. So um, here we are in India. Uh, I noticed it seems like Google Maps actually puts real weather uh, on, on their satellite view now. At least that looks like real weather. I hear that there's some kind of cyclone happening that we will, uh, some of us will have to fly back through. So I'm not looking forward to that. Um, but I'm really excited to be in India. I've only been in India once before. That was almost a decade ago. I've never been to Bangalore. Um, really grateful to be here. And uh, I just want to also take this moment uh, while we're here in India together to um, recognize a few different people and a few different groups for their um, contributions to Appium. Um, and this is something that I think is really important because, you know, I obviously get a lot of attention for, you know, standing up and talking at things like this. Uh, and so there's sort of an inappropriate level of focus that gets put on people like me and Dan. Um, but it's an open source project and uh, the real um, uh, drive for Appium is not even the maintainers, but it's the people that use Appium and the people that contribute in so many little ways every day. Uh, so if it were just for me and Dan, there would be no Appium conference. It's really um, because of all of you. So I just wanted to ask if you've ever, uh, if you've ever contributed code to Appium before, would you uh, raise your hand? Awesome. Yeah, good, good handful of people. And if you, so just keep your hands up. And if you have ever um, contributed uh, some documentation to Appium, raise your hand too. Okay. And if you've ever um, submitted a bug to Appium. Yeah, a lot more people, that's what I expected. And if you've ever gone onto the Appium forums and um, either asked for help or uh, you know, help someone else, else out on the Appium Discuss forums. So that's like a lot of people. So I just wanted to um, you know, take this moment to recognize that this is the kind of uh, contribution that really makes the project work and uh, makes it awesome. So thank you all for um, the part that you play in moving Appium forward. So, um, kind of theme for this talk, uh, such as it is, it, you know, it's really a, a thinly veiled disguise to do some kind of fun experimental thing later on, but we have to have a talk uh, first. So, uh, what we're going to talk about is um, the changes that are underway in our industry. Um, I don't know about you, but it seems like as I look at the type of work that um, QA engineers and, and software testing professionals are responsible for, it keeps uh, getting more and more complex. The, the cost of quality failures keep getting higher as uh, the importance of well-functioning and well-designed applications gets higher. And um, it gets hard to keep up with the additional requirements. So, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, if you were in software testing, you would be expected to you know, make sure that the app worked on a functional level, and that was pretty much it. But we're very much in a new world right now. You know, we've, we've moved uh, pretty far beyond functional testing as the basic set of requirements uh, for jobs in our industry, and now we, have, uh, now we have responsibility for things like visual testing. Uh, we have to make sure that our app looks good and uh, hasn't, you know, doesn't have some kind of visual regression or bug. We're responsible for performance testing, because it's not just uh, whether our app functions or not that's important, but it's uh, how quickly it functions and the type of experience that, uh, that the users get. Um, there's more broadly user experience testing, which encompasses a whole, a whole host of other kinds of, of testing, but really puts the focus on uh, user experience quite broadly. Um, and wants to make sure not just, again, that the app functions as intended, but that it does so in a way which is 
uh, actually meeting the, the needs uh, of your users. And there's, you know, if you're some kind of video or audio streaming app, you obviously care about the quality of the content that you're delivering and not just, you know, whether it's delivered at one frame per second uh, versus 60 frames per second or whatever. Um, there's a lot of really important aspects to audio visual uh, or audio video testing um, that, you know, we didn't really have to care too much about, um, especially before uh, the mobile devices came along and we started consuming media all the time um, everywhere. And obviously more, I mean, I'm sure there are people in this room who are doing kinds of testing that I haven't even uh, considered, you know, and that's kind of the point that I'm making is hello. the kinds of testing we're responsible for uh, is expanding um, and it's expanding very quickly. So um, to dig into a, a, a few of these a little bit more specifically, uh, you know, we're probably familiar with visual testing. Um, this has been around for a while now, and uh, our, our Appium Comp sponsors, Apple Tools, have really um, pioneered this as a testing discipline in a really important way. Um, but if you've never done visual testing before, haven't gotten into it yet, uh, it's basically uh, designed to answer the question of, of whether your app's visual appearance has changed in a way which is not intended, uh, which could indicate any number of different problems. Um, and just to, to talk about a few ways that bugs could enter in uh, to the app on a visual level that don't really map to the functional level, you could have uh, intrusive or absent elements, you know, things that that uh, shouldn't be there that are, or things that should be there that aren't, that don't necessarily affect uh, kind of the, the functional level of the application, but really affect the user experience. There could obviously be style or design bugs. Your app could look ugly, and that would be really bad, um, but that's the kind of thing that would never be caught by, uh, you know, one of the standard type of Appium tests that's just looking for elements and interacting with them and so on. Um, there could be bugs due to, um, you know, form factors or device layouts that weren't considered in app development, and all of a sudden you're running on a different kind of device, and the layout is totally broken. And you know, again, that's the kind of thing that a standard Appium test wouldn't wouldn't tend to catch as long as all elements are there. Um, there's also stuff like internationalization bugs where uh, developers assume that strings are a certain length, and that's what makes the layout work, and then you translate your app into other languages which have, you know, different, uh, different writing directions or different lengths uh, of, of words and phrases, and you can get some pretty nasty visual bugs there. So this is the kind of stuff that we're now responsible for that, uh, again, we, we weren't um, so responsible for before the, the state of the art in app development improved and before the importance of getting all these things right uh, really moved, moved forward in a big way. There's also uh, the category of performance testing, which is in a way really trying to answer the question of whether our apps are responsive enough, uh, you know, making sure that they're not stalling, making sure that they're not uh, too slow and frustrating users. And you know, there's all these studies that have been done uh, that show that users are actually, you know, a, a quite easily frustrated group of people, uh, much more easily frustrated than, you know, developers of applications when they're using their own apps. And, uh, you know, if you have a delay of even fractions of a second, some scenarios, it can really turn a user off of an application. So it's super important to have uh, a very responsive app. Um, and people are beginning to test this as a discipline and to test it in automated ways. Um, so some of the things that you can, uh, that can lead to performance problems in app development uh, or, you know, network design and things like that are, you know, developers often make the mistake of, of writing code that somehow, you know, does something bad with the UI thread and your app becomes non-responsive. Or you can have uh, situations where the network is slower than you anticipated and that leads to a bad user experience. Or your back-end team might have a poor network stack design where they've, uh, you know, I was talking with uh, some folks at Headspin who um, focus a lot on performance testing and learning a bit about the types of problems that, that they see and, uh, you know, one, one problem that they see is network connection objects on the app, uh, in the app code not being reused well. And so, you know, all these network requests are continually uh, 
recreated and you have all the overhead of new TCP connections and stuff that uh, really uh, increases the amount of time that it takes for content or images to load and you know a simple fix in the network stack or the, the use of the network APIs for iOS or Android could fix this but often people don't uncover these things during app development and so it comes to testers to uncover these bugs and ideally know a little bit about what could be some of the problems leading to them. Um, of course, there's also kind of typical performance issues that, that plague any software application um, when in certain scenarios you overuse system resources and this is especially problematic on mobile because obviously mobile devices are pretty resource constrained compared to you know, our laptop computers. They're quite powerful, remarkably powerful in fact, but uh, you know, especially on Android, it was problematic in the earlier years when uh, one app could take up too many system resources and really negatively impact the performance of the whole device. And so, um, you know, it's really important to have good uh, app development hygiene to make sure that you're not using too many of these resources and tools like um, the data analysis of performance data, uh, flame graphs, and all that kind of stuff help help uh, testers and developers figure out where these problems are breaking in. Um, also, sometimes when we do testing, we're, we're not totally aware of all of the contexts in which our app will be used. So, you know, people that are developing for one market uh, that tends to use a certain type of device might not realize that their app is being downloaded and used by a completely different market that tends to use uh, devices which are, you know, much lower powered than they were developing on. Um, and so they're kind of leaving a lot of money on the table, so to speak, by not uh, testing for these other markets where their application could be much more popular and successful if, uh, if they only, you know, coded to the, to the particular hardware um, that those people use. So we also have, you know, just to take one more example, uh, audio and video testing, um, which is particularly important for applications that deal with um, streaming video and audio, which are a lot of applications nowadays, and we probably, each of us have our handful of apps on our, our devices that we use to, to watch uh, TVs and TV and movies and uh, listen to music and so on. So there can be a lot of issues here, right, um, that wouldn't necessarily be caught by an Appium test um, because Appium isn't, isn't really designed for, um, you know, high, high frame rate capture and, and verification of video and stuff like that. So you could have, of course, dropped frames, which really impact the user experience, um, even though the video itself is still playing. Um, videos can also fail to play, but if you're just checking for whether an element exists in your application, you might not realize that, you know, the, the most important element, the video element, isn't actually playing, and you might have to go on your way with your functional test without verifying this. And obviously there's a number of ways to verify that a video is actually playing. Um, you could have a you know, high frame rate video that's playing, but it could you know, have a lot of chunks and blocks and, and weird compression artifacts in it. And the same is true for audio, of course, uh, that, that would make these types of media completely uh, unconsumable and very unpleasant experiences. Um, but of course, you have to have some way of telling whether your video is actually playing in quality uh, or not. And then, of course, there, just as with the performance testing case, there can be issues with uh, the back end in, in all of these applications because, obviously, for um, media content uh, apps, the, the delivery system for the content is, is very important, and there can be bugs there as well. So this is just kind of a little uh, exploration into some of the kinds of testing that you've likely been um, you know, hitting your head against depending on the app that you're responsible for automating. So the, the basic point here is that, you know, it's, it's probably the case for you that you feel your job is getting more complex, that the requirements are stacking up, um, that you're responsible for more and newer kinds of testing, and uh, you may or may not feel that you have the appropriate tools to deal with all these cases. I certainly don't think that there's a perfect set of tools for all of these kinds of, of test cases. And so, you know, we're in a situation where we, we've been cobbling together different systems to deal with different types of testing, and some of it's automated and some of it's not, 
Um, but there's certainly no one right way to do all this and an awful lot of complexity that can get pretty overwhelming. Um, the, of course, there are tools that, that try and deal with these things, um, but as with a lot of other areas of software development, as we get more and more complex in the kinds of stuff we can build, we get more and more complex in the ways we can test it, and we wind up with lots and lots of tools that compete with each other, and it feels that uh, you know, the second we learn one tool to help us do our job, there's now another tool which is you know, potentially better, but we don't really know, and should we learn that one? Um, so there's an awful lot of, of tools out there, which leads to a, a sense of fatigue, as has often been noted and, you know, and, and made fun of in, in the web development community with JavaScript frameworks and things like that. But I would argue that the same is happening in um, pretty much every area of, of software development. So how do, we, you know, how do we deal with this proliferation of tools? I think it's a really important open question. How do we structure our teams? Uh, do we specialize? Uh, do we have individuals who specialize in one type of testing? Do we just, you know, train ourselves more in all these other kinds of tools as well? We hire more people for our teams. Do we scale back our expectations of what we can test? What are the, what are the realistic expectations in this kind of new world? Um, and since it's, you know, 2019, it would be an omission, uh, you know, not to mention one of the really big themes that's out there in the industry right now and is trying to deal with some of this uh, tool fatigue and some of the fatigue that comes from having all of these new responsibilities and that's sort of the rise of AI and machine learning for testing. So obviously AI and machine learning is a big topic again in every area of the software industry and has been uh, put to use uh, to good application in a lot of different fields. Uh, when I say good application, I should say successful application. It's, it's often not that good or necessarily positive for the world, but it can be very effective at solving uh, certain kinds of problems. And so there's a lot of people out there who are trying to apply uh, AI um, and machine learning approaches to testing. Um, so there's sort of uh, more lightweight and more uh, you know, serious ways that people are trying to do this. Uh, and it kind of spans the spectrum from kind of image recognition tools, which you know you might call AI, you might call machine learning, you, you might not, maybe they're just kind of specialized algorithms for, for image work. But of course, the terms AI and machine learning get applied to a lot of things nowadays um, that maybe technically aren't, uh, te technically don't fit that definition. Um, but there's also a, a spectrum of, of solutions to these problems, some of which do kind of move into the, the, the real fields of artificial intelligence and and machine learning at least. So, you know, again, there's, there's image analysis. Um, Appium has tools for this now. Uh, there are companies, uh, again, like Apple Tools, that have formed whole businesses around making this part really work well and uh, putting a lot of smart people to, to work on, you know, figuring out what the right models are for doing this kind of thing. Um, there's uh, machine learning that attempts to help us with uh, analyzing our, our user experience data. So taking some of that um, performance data, for example, and uh, uh, giving it to us in ways that make it easy for us to figure out what's going on. So obviously, you know, I showed that image before of the performance, um, you know, uh, data, and it was a little bit too, uh, you know, complex for me to really understand what's going on. So now there are tools that take the raw data and try and, and use it to surface the important bits to us so that we have a relatively good idea of, oh, you know, this combination of um, network bottleneck and uh, something else means that it's likely that your backend server is misconfigured. You know, so tools that try and help us uh, go more directly to an answer about what could be wrong versus forcing us to slog through reams and reams of data to, to figure that out on our own. Uh, and the same is true for our tests themselves because um, our tests aren't just uh, verification for application, they're also um, bits of data. And as we run lots and lots of tests and we move into a, a world of, of continuous integration and continuous development where we're running thousands of tests multiple times a day, all of a sudden we have a lot of test data and uh, we want ways of kind of sifting through that and figuring out what could be the root cause of a flaky test or something like that um, without having to go in and again dig through all the, the data ourselves. 
So there are machine learning approaches uh, which are you know, offered by different folks that try and help us wrangle our uh, tests themselves into submission um, in a way which, which helps them to serve us rather than getting overwhelmed by uh, you know, going through all of our test results. There are test authoring tools, um, some of which claim to be you know, totally using a, you know, an artificial intelligence approach, some of which are more simple. You know, so there's tools, very simple tools, that, like Appium Desktop, which you probably use, that has a very simple uh, recording system that can generate some code for you. And you know, it doesn't work particularly well, but it can help you if you're learning the Appium API all the way to um, you know, folks like Testim or Test Project, which are trying to uh, uh, offer whole uh, environments for authoring your tests without having to code at all. Uh, and again, there, uh, we can debate the merits of these approaches, but it's an example of different folks that are out there trying to apply these um, techniques to solving the problem of test authoring, which you know, is, is a real problem for sure. And then kind of even one step beyond that, there are tools and companies that are trying to make the, the problem of testing sort of go away entirely by having tests automatically created and automatically discovered from your application. And so, you know, a company I've been working with like uh, Test AI is trying to do this um, by, you know, you just give them their app and then they, they generate uh, tests and they generate reports for you without you having to even take the step of authoring a test. So again, there are um, people trying to use uh, AI and machine learning to solve all these different problems. And I think it's worth uh, following this trend and seeing how successful it is in solving those different types of problems, while of course taking uh, all of the, the marketing hype with a grain of salt and waiting to see how truly useful these things are day to day, um, because quite honestly, some of the more radical approaches I don't find are more effective today than uh, some of the, the traditional approaches of just writing, writing test code. Um, but it's worth paying attention and, and seeing how these things evolve and improve and whether they can indeed uh, fulfill the promise um, that, that they have um, been giving us. So where does Appium fit in this um, new landscape of different kinds of testing and different tools and different approaches for solving all these new problems? Um, well, obviously it's not gonna do everything, but um, it, I like to think of it as the common interface for platform automation. So, um, you know, I would be very surprised if Appium ever became opinionated about how you should run your tests, uh, or for it even to know about tests in the first place. Uh, Appium, like Selenium, is an automation tool that lets you, uh, you know, con remote control uh, a mobile device. Um, but I think the vision for Appium, as we've been saying for years, is obviously beyond mobile devices, beyond browsers, but viewing it as a common interface for automating any type of platform. And obviously the Appium team could never uh, create automation capabilities for every platform that's out there, which is why we have to have a, a big vision and share it with the world, and get all kinds of people coming and contributing automation for different types of platforms. Um, so I think there are a lot of benefits to this way of approaching um, uh, uh, Appium's philosophy. Uh, one for all of us is to, to help reduce the tool fatigue is that there's less cognitive overload when we're dealing with one API. You know, we call it the WebDriver API today. Uh, you know, maybe in 10 years it'll be called the AppDriver API, uh, or maybe we'll, we'll, maybe we'll call it StarDriver like we've always wanted. But the basic idea is that the more we can uh, reuse the same APIs, the less, uh, the less new things we have to learn, and that makes our lives a lot easier. It helps us adopt new tools and new technologies without um, feeling like we have to throw away everything we've learned and start again from scratch. Um, another benefit is extensibility of the Appium platform. Uh, the way we've designed and architected it, it's really easy to build new uh, Appium WebDriver compatible drivers. Basically, all of the web driver stuff is abstracted away, and you don't, you don't even have to think about it when you create a new driver. You can just worry about how to automate the particular platform that you're creating a driver for. Um, coming with Appium 2.0, which you know, we're still kind of working through the, the right design for this, but uh, I think work will begin on it soon. 
Um, we've, we've introduced the concept of plugins that could enable uh, you know, stuff like the thing that I built that you might have heard about, which enables you to use uh, a, a, an image classification model to find elements using Appium. So this would be an example of a plugin that's used for a single purpose of finding elements that you could download. Um, and some people might use this plugin and some people might not care about it. Um, but you can have a whole ecosystem of plugins that help extend Appium in different ways uh, that you know, don't need to be part of the main, uh, the main server. And of course, you can mix, mix and match drivers and, and plugins um, as part of this vision. Um, and finally, we always want to kind of keep the philosophy that we've had of being this big umbrella and having a big community and not just focusing on one type of platform, but uh, really you know, giving people tools to bring new platforms into the fold. And I think that that's been really successful. You know, we've had kind of new surprising drivers show up like the, the UI TV group uh, created a, a third party driver or Samsung created a third party driver for Tizen that we, we had no idea they were even working on. And then one day it just showed up um, in Appium and it's like, great. So we, wanna, we want that kind of thing to keep happening. Of course, as I already said, Appium is not gonna try to do everything. So I think we need to be clear about kind of the, the place that Appium has. And um, I like to uh, think of it in, in this way where there's kind of a, a really high quality um, open source core, which is Appium, and um, the world doesn't need to compete on the kind of stuff that Appium does. And then there's a whole ecosystem of you know, open source tools and paid services uh, that kind of surround this and make it better, and people can choose which things they like and which things they don't. Java. I knew, I, I just knew that Java was gonna ruin my talk somehow. <laughs> I'm blaming Angie. She just released a Java course. Uh, so that's probably why. Um, so anyway, I think you get the point. Um, but uh, I, I like to think also that Appium will keep up with the future. So it's not that we're gonna say no to all of this uh, AI and machine learning and stuff and say, well, someone else will do that. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll get in there and we'll get, we'll get in the mess of it and try and figure things out too, uh, which we already have been. You know, we've added image recognition features. We've been working with Test AI to add, you know, this experimental element finding AI to Appium. Um, right now we're working on ways to group commands together uh, to send to cloud services when you're running Appium tests so that you don't have to deal with uh, latency of commands going back and forth. Uh, and obviously, we're, we're always committed to keeping up with the Android and iOS platform updates and, and general maintenance and stuff like that. And then, you know, there's always new and useful techniques that we learn about, often from the community saying, oh, did you know you could use ADB to do this? And we say, oh, we didn't know that, but now we can make it an Appium feature. And we generally do, so we, we keep adding uh, things that seem useful. So uh, in my remaining time, uh, I want to uh, just share a little fun example of something I've been working on to try and illustrate this point of Appium kind of expanding, uh, continuing to expand its platform umbrella. Um, you might have seen a talk I did in 2016 in London uh, at the Selenium conference called App to the Future, which was maybe my favorite talk that I've ever given because it was all based around uh, 80s movies puns um, like this one, which I don't know. I am a dad now, so I suppose um, dad jokes are totally appropriate. I wasn't at the time, I guess I was just practicing. Um, but one of the points I was making in this talk, or I was sort of imagining, you know, what would it be like to have Appium for uh, an X-Wing? Um, and, uh, you know, I imagine that you could use the WebDriver API to, you know, find and shoot some proton torpedoes and what that would look like. And it was sort of a, a tongue-in-cheek way of talking about uh, automating, you know, physical things and, and uh, automating the, the Internet of Things. So um, that's sort of what I've been trying to ex experiment. I sort of put it out there in the universe, like, what would Appium for IoT look like? Uh, trying to do the, the Jason Huggins thing where you put it out there and then someone, like, does it, but nobody did it uh, in the last, like, three years. So I was like, fine, I guess I'll do something with it. I don't know how useful uh, this kind of IoT automation will be, um, but let me show you what, what I've done. So this is something uh, put out by a company called Adafruit. Um, 
screens over here. Um, and it's a, it's, a little, uh, it's a little computer, really, that has lots of sensors, and you can hook wires up to it and get signals in and get signals out, and you can put code on it and have it do whatever you want, basically. Um, so I took this thing, and then I thought, what can I do with this? And uh, I decided to find a, a yogurt container from the refrigerator and empty it out and put some buttons in it. And uh, I, I clipped uh, some wires from these buttons uh, together with this um, circuit playground device and then wrote some code. Actually, in Python, it's really easy to do this kind of thing uh, such that, you know, whenever I press a button, the, one of these LEDs will turn from red to green. Um, but so the whole thing looks kind of like this. Uh, there's a video of it. You know, you press a button and one of the LEDs turns from red to green. But that's not all that happens um, because I was also able to connect up a little homemade audio cable and have it so that every time you press one of these buttons, a sound is produced. So this is actually a little drum machine, um, which I'll, I'll show you what it sounds like in a minute. So kind of from a schematic point of view, I don't know anything about electronics, really. I was trying to get Hugs to explain some stuff to me, so I don't know how to do electronic schematics. Uh, this is my, <laughs> my own version of it. But you have your buttons. They're connected with some wires, and they need to be grounded to uh, the, the board. And then you have some headphones. And whenever you press one of the buttons, the light turns on, and some sound is sent to your headphones. So pretty straightforward. Uh, this is my first project like this that I did. It was super fun. Highly recommend playing around with this kind of stuff. So this is basically the app, right? So I have this drum machine. It's a little device that I created. Now I'm thinking about how can we test this app? Um, and you could think of different ways to test it. We could test it um, just by writing more software to put on this device that would trigger the audio output. But then I'm not really testing uh, the inputs to this device. I'm not really testing what happens when an electrical signal comes in. I'm just testing sort of from the software on the way out. I could create a robot that would hit the buttons. Um, that's probably what Jason would have done. Um, but I don't know robotics, and um, that seemed a little overkill to me. No offense, Jason. But um, I, what, I, what I thought, and this actually was an idea from uh, my partner at CloudGrade, Jonah, is what if we had another device um, that was designed to send electrical signals into this device. So in other words, instead of buttons being connected here, uh, we would have this other device actually just sending electrical signals in. So it's still an end-to-end -end test, um, but it's not, uh, it doesn't require me to manually press buttons. So I got something called a Raspberry Pi, which is you know, a, basically a full-fledged computer. Uh, can run versions of Linux and stuff like that. And it has these things uh, at the top you can see a, a big row of little metal pins, and it's called the, the general purpose input-output header. And so it's just a bunch of pins that can send and receive electrical signals. Um, so what I was able to do is get the uh, Raspberry Pi, get some wires, connect them from the general purpose input-output pins, and hook them up to the same spots on the, the uh, circuit playground where the buttons connect. So it looks something like this when they're coming out of the Raspberry Pi. And then when I connect them to the circuit playground, I'm basically just using alligator clips to connect them to the exact same spot where the buttons connect. And I'm not even disconnecting the buttons. I'm leaving them connected. So I'm not modifying the app under test. <laughs> right? So this is a, in true Appium fashion. We're, just, uh, we're connecting these alligator clips so that we can send electrical signals um, and trigger the behavior of, of my app. So then what I was able to do is actually write an Appium driver for the Raspberry Pi GPIO so that I can call, uh, so I can write a test script on my laptop that creates a session on uh, the Appium Raspberry Pi driver and then basically tells it what to do with its pins. You know, should a particular pin send an electrical signal? Should it, that signal be high or low? Should it be an input or output pin? You know, all those kinds of electronical things that I don't really understand but was able to, to muddle my way through and get something working. Um, so what does this driver look like? Well, it's pretty simple. Um, I'm not showing you the implementation here, obviously, but it just has a few methods in it. It only supports four web driver commands, uh, create and delete session. So we can start a session and stop it. 
we can find an element, which in this case is just one of the pins that we want to, to automate, and we can set a value on one of those pins. Um, and the values that are supported are, are either one or zero, because the pin can be either um, high or low. And uh, then I had to basically think about, well, how do we map you know, pins on the uh, Raspberry Pi to the um, actual inputs on the circuit playground? And so I decided that that would be what the app is. So we define an app as just a set of pins mapped to um, IDs, which are just strings that, that define a certain place on the, the circuit playground, and we talk about what their mode is and what their initial state should be when our test begins. So that's how we create a session. And now I'm able to you know, find an element by its ID. In this case, I'm finding the A1 element, which because I've set this up in my app mapping, I know maps to uh, pin 7 on the Raspberry Pi. And I'm able to either set that pin to low or high using send keys. So that's how the Appium Raspberry Pi driver works. Let's actually try it. If I could get your help, Dan. Um, I know I'm running out of time. I'll try and do this as quickly as I can. So here we have my phone, which Dan is going to um, use here so you can see what's happening. And then I have my Raspberry Pi, which I'm going to turn on. And I haven't plugged it into anything yet. So here's my, my test, test device. And then here is... my app, <laughs> and I'm going to plug the audio in. So the app should be working. Um, do I have, uh, I don't know. If... So there's my little drum machine. I'm not really a drummer, but um, super fun. Um, so, the, so the app is working. So now all I need to do to test it obviously is uh, connect the Raspberry Pi stuff here to the right spot. So this one will go here. Hopefully it's not just touching the rubber. And this one will go here. And I'm just remembering where they go. Hopefully I'm getting it right. Uh, and then this one will go here. Okay. So things still work. You know, I can still, still play the drums. Um, but now hopefully I'll also be able to control it from my Raspberry Pi. So I'm going to go to my terminal here and connect to the Raspberry Pi over local Ethernet. So now I'm actually on my Raspberry Pi. I'll try and make this a bit bigger. And um, I'm going to start up. So I'm just going to make sure all the pins are in a good state first. And then I'm going to go into my Raspberry Pi driver. So this is actually running on the Raspberry Pi using Node.js. Um, and I'm going to start the Appium server, making sure that I can connect to it from my laptop. So while that's starting, um, show you our, our test code. It's basically what I showed on the slides. Um, here it is. It has some extra functions that have to do with like playing drum notes and stuff. But you know, here's the function that will hit a drum. Um, you know, basically it it sends a certain pin state and then waits for a certain amount of time and then resets it. And that's what is basically the equivalent of hitting one of these buttons. And, uh, and then here's where I've defined the song that I want to be played. Just a bunch of um, drum hits, basically. So now if everything is connected, I should be able to run my Appium script here. And we'll see, oops. All right, yeah, so there we go. Um, now, obviously, for, uh, okay, thanks, Dan, appreciate that. Um, obviously, for this to be a real test, we would need to capture that audio and perform some kind of audio analysis to make sure that 
it actually played the right song, that the, the drums weren't hooked up incorrectly or things like that. Uh, I didn't do that, but um, I did recently write an Appian Pro article on how you can um, perform audio verification using audio fingerprinting. So uh, that is an exercise left to the reader. Um, so that's basically it. Um, just as a way of summing up everything I've been saying, the WebDriver API is pretty flexible. You can use it for automating websites or uh, you know, input-output pins on a microcontroller. Yes. Um, and uh, you can run it in a lot of places. I, I was actually pleasantly surprised that I could actually run the Appium server on the Raspberry Pi. Um, I didn't have to do anything special for that. That's just because the, the technology involved in the Raspberry Pi is, is awesome already, and it's just Linux, so I can install Node.js and actually did all the coding on the Raspberry Pi over SSH, too, um, which is pretty fun. It was super easy to create this driver. It's less than 250 lines of code. Um, there's an open question of whether this kind of thing is truly useful for business applications. I have no idea, um, but it's super fun, and it's the kind of thing I think we should all be doing because uh, someday some application will come around and then we'll have the technology to deal with it. And again, like I said last year, it's important to get out there and do creative stuff with Appium even if uh, there's not some uh, pressing business need for it. Um, a couple of people asked me, you know, Jonathan, did you bring your guitar or ukulele and are you going to play a song um, this year? And no, I did play a little bit of really bad drums for you, but I'm sure that was not quite as pleasant. Um, but there is something kind of cool that's happening right now, which is that all of the songs that I've done involving Appium in the last you know, five or six years, uh, including the, the, the one where uh, I did last year at Appium Comp 2018, uh, they've all been released or are being released on an album that my band is putting out. Uh, it's going to be released next Tuesday. So if you're interested in hearing studio versions of the songs that uh, I wrote specifically for Appium and involving Appium automation, um, you can check out our album that is released everywhere. Okay, <laughs> thank you everyone. <laughs>